Okay, uh, different uh, question here. We've got a um, question about uh, your infamous role um, with regard to um, Attorney General Ashcroft being hospitalized. And I didn't do it. <laughs> well, I'm glad we've got that it's out. It's a natural now. illness. <laughs> uh, so Attorney General Ashcroft is, uh, uh, you know, perhaps on his deathbed. He's very sick. Uh, you've got this Hollywood-like scene of you rushing to the hospital, and then you've got um, uh, uh, the chief of staff to President Bush, Andrew Card, and you've got um, uh, the president's counsel, uh, Gonzalez rushing there as well. Could you walk us through what happened that night and then um, the, the showdown that you had with the president along with uh, FBI Director Mueller? Uh, I'd rather not. Uh, I, I, I mean, I guess I don't want to repeat. I mean, I've only really talked about this publicly once when I testified. Um, the, the brief sketch, as I said to the Senate Judiciary Committee was, uh, we'd had a disagreement about an intelligence program that I wouldn't uh, certify. And the, um, not that I remember the dates, but on Wednesday, March the 10th, uh, 2004, the Attorney General was in the hospital very ill. And his wife had refused all visitors and phone calls. And I was being kept posted on his condition by his chief of staff, who would hear from Mrs. Ashcroft. And I was on my way home sometime around 8 o'clock with my security detail. Back in those days, I had a nice armored Suburban. And we were going down Constitution Avenue, and I got a call from the Attorney General's Chief of Staff saying that uh, Mr. Card and Mr. Gonzalez were on their way to the hospital to see the Attorney General. And he believed, the Chief of Staff, as I did instantly, that it related to the matter that I had taken a strong position on and that they were going to seek to have me overruled. So I told my security detail, the U.S. Marshal Service, to get me to George Washington Hospital immediately. And then I called Bob Mueller, who was at dinner with his wife, and told him what was happening. And he said, I'll be there right now. So he ran out of a restaurant and got in his armored Suburban and started heading there. And I called my chief of staff, and I said, get everybody to the hospital. And he knew what I, I, I maybe gave him a couple sentences. And then he started calling staff members saying, get to George Washington Hospital now. And I didn't know what that was all, I didn't even know why I did that. Um, I grew up in a culture in the Southern District of New York where if, an, if one of your colleagues was in trouble, a message went out, all hands. And that meant everybody, drop what you're doing and go uh, to help. And so that was all I could think of. And so we went there and I ran up the stairs and got there first and went into the dark room. And uh, John Ashgrove was there and his wife was standing there. And he was very sick. And I tried to talk to him and wasn't getting much progress and told him what I thought was happening and then sat down to wait. And then my two advisors on this, Goldsmith and Pat Philbin, came in and stood behind me. We just waited. And then Card and Gonzalez came in and spoke to the Attorney General and then had an exchange and then they turned and left. And, uh, and then right after they left, the Director Mueller arrived and came in. Now, we know from um, various press accounts that this meeting was then followed by a meeting in the White House where the president called you in to talk to you uh, because you still hadn't recertified uh, this uh, domestic surveillance program. Um, and you threatened to resign. Um, I actually didn't. Yeah, I, I don't know why. It sounds like an odd thing, but I, I believed that people should not, should do their best make their best argument, try to get the right thing done, and if they can't, decide whether they can stay. I, I never liked people saying, if I don't get my way, you know, I'm gonna hold my breath till I fall, fall on the ground, or I'll quit and embarrass you if you don't do what I want. I, I thought it was more, I don't know, I'm probably wrong in this, but I, I thought it was more honorable to say, here's where I am, here's what we're gonna do. They can, they're no dummies though, they know, they can tell by looking at me how serious I was. And so I, I never, I worked very hard not to threaten to resign. That's a s distinction without a difference, maybe, because everybody in the world, I think, they knew what was going to happen. So you had this conversation with the president where it became clear what your intentions were? I don't know the answer to that. And I, I don't, I'm not comfortable talking about my conversation with the president. Okay. And I've been asked that before. And the answer is, I, 
I think, I don't want to do anything that would make the next president afraid to talk to the next me. And, and if I talk about a conversation with the president about the substance of it, uh, I just worry that that will chill. A real problem in our government was averted because he spoke to me and spoke to Bob Mueller privately. And I, I don't know, maybe I'm an idealist, but I, I'd like, to, whoever, whether it's President Obama or someone I can't even know the name of, I'd like them to invite the next me into the study i got two questions, one's retrospective and one's prospective. Uh, retrospectively, do you feel that um, the Bush administration's policies and the war on terror work to make the United States safer? Yes, on balance, I do, yeah. And looking forward, uh, do you feel that uh, Barack Obama is uh, making the country weaker? No, I don't think that. I have, I, again, I. I guess time will tell. The poor man's only been in office for I don't know how many days now, 70 some days, and he's had a little bit going on. But just looking at the people he's chosen, I like and respect Eric Holder a great deal. In fact, I, uh, just to make sure I'd never you know, get invited to Republican Party uh, meetings again, I sent a letter of support on his behalf. But uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, I happen to think he's a good, honest person. And, and I think he gets this. I think, I think people like that represent what I hope is the great middle on national security. And, and I think there's a lot of those people in the Obama administration. At the margins, you'll see differences that you know, reasonable people can disagree about. But at the core, I think you're going to continue to see two things. An aggressive effort to take the fight where the bad guys are. And there's no doubt where they are outside the United States in, in force. And, and to be you know, vigilant and tough in the United States. Um, so the answer is, I do think the, the Bush administration, it depends on how you define the war on terror. I, it was a term I never liked, because I don't know what, how do you have a war on a, on a phrase like, on a word like that? Uh, anyhow, I, and, and I don't define it, I think of it as counterterrorism uh, more narrowly. Others have a much more expansive definition of the global war on terror. Uh, last question. Uh, uh, you've got President Obama who's announced that um, that Guantanamo Bay uh, facility is going to be closed within a year's time. What do you think should happen to the prisoners who are now being held there? Great question. Uh, well, whatever can be done, first of all, those who shouldn't be there, uh, and there are some very difficult problems in that regard, we need help from other countries to relocate them. and. Despite all the criticism Guantanamo's gotten from a lot of our uh, brothers and sisters in the, in, the, in the family of nations, we haven't gotten a lot of people stepping up to say, we'll take so-and-so, we'll take so-and-so. Um, something's got to be done to incapacitate. There are some really bad people there, and something's got to be done to incapacitate them. Given the history and, and some of the things that may have happened to some of these people before they got there, hugely difficult problem. I mean, the easy part was announcing that Eric Holder will lead a study of what to do. The hard part's going to be figuring out exactly what to do. And it may be that, that they'll need to come up with some sort of non-criminal adjudication mechanism uh, if they can't put some of these people into the criminal justice system. Because you just, you just can't, whatever you think of what on, went on before, you just can't let some of these people go. Uh, or you'll never, you'll never be able to look people in the eye who suffer the, the, the next attack. Mr. Sorry to end on that happy note. But. <laughs> Mr. Comey, thank you very much for joining us. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thanks.